I don't want you to honor me. I want us to honor each other. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So that was just a sidetrack. Like, Pastor Carson does that all the time. So I, I'm imitating it. And Pastor Morris does that too. So um, before I start, guys, I just want to thank you for being here today in the house of the Lord. Everybody in the house. Uh, Daryl, thank you very much for the announcement you gave me from the Commandos MC. So Commando MC is a motorcycle club here, and I think they are in Niskew. I think their clubhouse is in Niskew. Been there uh, with them. They're a great organization. They today are doing a um, show and shine in motorcycle, cars, trucks. Um, I got the address here. Uh, we can talk about it after. They're raising money. There's a free barbecue, free, 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 but they're just gonna ask you money if you wanna give. They're doing a fundraiser to, uh, they're, they're raising money for a canine unit dog. Do you know what they're doing usually? Their, their, their main line, when they do a fundraiser, they're doing uh, a, a canine or a dog for PTSD people. So people coming from the police force or the army. Service dog, Service dog that's what it is. And the people that's got the PAS, P, uh, uh, PTSD, sorry, PTSD, uh, sometimes they have a service dog. And they are raising the money. They're paying people to train those dogs and give it to the people. They're also involved with the military uh, 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 food bank. Yeah, Veterans, so, Association. Veterans Association food bank. Uh, so very, very organized uh, club. And I like it. They're an MC. They're very good people. So thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you for donating for, I call it Trevor's, uh, uh, Trevor's fundraiser. So I didn't know, healing hands? Hearts. Healing hearts. Healing hearts. So if you don't know, just say, I don't know what is it, the fundraiser and the Trevor is in charge Okay? So, uh, and uh, it's important as a church. You remember here or not, it's the body of Christ. We have something in common. Honoring culture, honoring culture, you know? What's your name? is what we talk about today. You, some of you heard me talking about what's your name before. But what's your name? Not talking Trevor, not talking Ken, not talking Pastor Morris. What's your name? What? Right, I know. I love it. Some people would say I'm a Christian. Some people would say I'm a Catholic. I'm a Christian. It's okay. It's all good. I like them all. What's your religion? What are you into? Right? Oh, I'm a Catholic. Oh, I'm a Christian. I'm from Quebec, guy. If you guys have doubt about that, now you know I'm from Montreal. I moved in, uh, I think, 2000 to Nova, uh, Nova Scotia to learn my English and started ministry there and came out here. Very, very fun story. And then you found the beautiful karma. Yes, I did. This mic is dangerous, Pastor Carson. I'm just going to stop talking. Stop being so French. There you go. I'm going to take the French out of it. So, um, <laughs> it's funny. I, I just lost it. My identity from being out east in Quebec is 95% Catholic. My whole family, they don't go to church. But they're Catholic, right? So that's their identity. It's like saying, uh, I'm going to church, I'm a Christian. Or, I'm going to church, I'm saved. It's pretty much the same thing, because we believe that we have an identity according to we were raised. I was baptized when I was, uh, what, a couple of months old. And that's okay. But in time in my life, I was 12 years old, the Lord started to speak to me when I was a kid. We're not going to Catholic Church anymore. We're going to, uh, in Quebec, they call that Pentecostal. So we were going at that church, and my mom would drive me to church all the time, would fall asleep there, and she was there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, she jumped Saturday, and she was there Sunday twice that day. And so, and I, and I loved to be here because it was a peace, even when I was a kid, I was a troubled kid. There was a peace I could find there. There was a piece that nobody could explain to me, and it would have had to. I knew there was something special there. So I wanted to know about that. So I eventually got the message, not from a preacher, not from anybody else, inside of me, 
that I knew that God would take care of me. I had given my life myself now. I decided my own action. I'm not talking against Catholic or any religion, but I just tell you what happened to me. And then there was an opportunity to be baptized. I had nobody or no need for nobody to tell me what baptism is because I was reading my Bible. And I knew that I had to say, people, this is what I choose today, and I did it myself. And so, the baptism I had when I was a few months old, for me, I did not make a decision to follow Jesus. It was just something we are doing. So was it my identity? It's a question I'm asking. It was not my identity. I did not decide, I was not engaged with it. Does that make sense? Yes. Sometimes we put a patch on, like the CMA people here, the, the prodigal sons here, uh, the other group, uh, and by the way, Bud, I know Bud Cowboy very well. He was my, uh, he was actually, um, he was actually a, a mentor for a short time in my life, Bud. And uh, so we gotta pray for Bud, he's a great man, great man of God. He's actually the chaplain. Is he still? Yes. He's chaplain for apostles. Right. So, um, He's a biker and he was a real cowboy too. Yeah, he is. Yeah. He was he is a tough guy. He's a tough guy. Gang, gang ranch. Yeah. He went to the with the big boys often. Uh, anyways. So my identity is sometimes who I become because I made the decision. My wife made a decision, she says yes. Her name changed that day and she says that would be weird, like Carla Laporte. And she's like, <laughs> she's like, okay. So, okay, but it did not change who she is. It changed her name. And now she believes that her identity, she is my wife. She's one with me, and I'm one with her. So that's our new identity. Oh, I'm talking about, hey, we're getting close to the subject here. It's just the intro. Um, and then, her name changed. Do you know what? I can see my wife in somebody else's car that's a male, pretty good looking male, all buffed up. And I won't be jealous because I know my wife. I know her. And her identity is that. My wife's we, we joke all the time, we're watching shows that we shouldn't watch. Sometimes, often, and, uh, and she's saying, she reminds me, who are you? Like, I have to turn up or put quieter. And, uh, but my wife knows who she is in the Lord, yes? But she is my wife. And I'm her husband, and I know that. That's my identity. Now let's step it up a notch. One day, I says, Jesus come into my life. Was that perfect that day? No. Nope. But there's a filter between me and God the Father now that sees me perfectly. I'm still messing up here. We call that grace. We're going to talk about that next week. So, but now that I know that I have a chance to survive, I want to be called a Christian. Christian is a little Christ. Christian is being like Christ, Christ-like is what Christian mean. I want to be Christ-like and I'm going to tell you it's impossible for me to please God if I don't come to Christ and accept His grace. Amen. So my identity is no longer conditional to this and that. I've got unconditional love. I have to come back to the cross daily to have that grace. The cross daily to have that grace. We call that humility and it's tough. Right? Are we ready to start this message? Are we starting to like frame our minds around identity? Is it good examples? No? I can't continue for an hour, then we'll start. No? Okay, good. Right? Oh, now we understand. Say bon? We have some French people here. We were born in Montreal, both of us. Bonjour. Bienvenue. Okay. Do you recognize that face? Any chances? that you would recognize that face behind me. Take a hit, take a, take a chance. Who? No. Julius Caesar. No. What? Julius Caesar. No. Who? No. 
You guys are close. You're close. That's not him. Come on, people. Ken. Come on, Pres. Madonna? What kind of mushroom are you putting on this pizza today? <laughs> this is Alexander the Great. It's a depiction of, okay? He didn't look like that in real life. I can promise you that. Uh. There you go. That's Alexander the Great. Why in the world is Slice bringing Alexander the Great? We're going to have a little story. And I promise we'll go into the Bible and we're going to have the word too. But to bring us in the mind, the frame that I want us to be in and start to think about identity today. There's a story. So we, we heard names like Julius Caesar, Cavegola, all those guys in the same area. The one thing they wanted is to conquer, and they were very good at it. The more you conquer, the better you are. And uh, one of the, uh, Alexander the Great did that very well. Very, very well. Okay? We're not praising what the guy's done. We're just bringing it as an example. He was very nice, young looking uh, man. He was very, very young. I think he died at 32 years old. Like, he was very young when he died. But he was a smart guy. Imagine the guy working for the Lord. That would have taken, he would have just taken the whole world. Right? But he, so one day, they're at war. And uh, he's going to report from the general from the other side asking for a thread, a, a thread like a, a, truce. a truce thread. Right? Or asking for a thread, or a truth. And, <laughs> my God, sorry, man. Um, and then uh, he, say, he says, okay, uh, come and talk to me and bring your bodyguards and we'll, we'll have that. So they started to talk and he says, hey, in the front line, I've been uh, having a report from one young man. He's a soldier. And he is yelling and cursing our army. He's saying stuff and he does not represent you good. He doesn't represent you well. He's saying stuff and stuff and and curses and, and very bad so you're not looking very professional down there and as your enemy I want to us to have that relationship of honor and I want to tell you what's going on over there so uh, he says thank you for doing that we're gonna take three days we stopped the war for three days and he called that kid so they got it took a few a few minutes they got the kid in the royal throne now Alexander the Great was the most vicious guy you can know, like Hitler-like. He's, it is, if it's, you know how it is, right? Gladiator movie, that's the same thing, okay? That one, he's dead, there's no if or but, he's gone. So, he got that uh, guy in chains, in the room of the throne. Alexander the Great is there with all his, his, his court people and everything. And you look at that kid, and the kid says, I am so dead right now. Not sure what I did wrong, but I'm so dead. So they explain. There's a, somebody, it's like in court. Somebody says, your accusation are that you did this and that, this and that. This does not represent our great king. This is not representative of what we want to do or what we're doing or who he is. We're present, representing our king we're at war. You want it or not, when we go at war here in Canada, we're presenting our country. That's pretty much the same thing. And they were in multiple countries. So that kid, he says, that's it now. I've got the verdict already against me. I don't have any chance to go and to win against the great Alexander the Great. But Alexander found him to be a good looking, reminding him of himself when he was younger. So he says, based on this, I'm going to ask him a few questions. I'm going to give him a chance. Maybe he's too young, he doesn't know what he's doing. So that was actually very, very out of character for the great. But he says, young man, you heard the accusation. Before we go with the sentence or what we're going to do in my judgment today, I will ask you one question. And you better think about it. What's your name? And the young man did not want to answer. The young man turned red, started to cry, fall face on the floor in front of the kings. You know, he was asking that he doesn't answer that question. 
Alexander the Great says, if you stay like that, I'm putting your head right now, and it's, it's done. We're done. So he stood up, and he says, my name is Alexander, sir. He knew there was something there. So Alexander the Great got a tantrum, like a kid. He got off of there. He wanted to kill him right away. But again, found that he was a young, beautiful kid, reminded of himself when he was a young man. So he did not have the discipline. So he says, I'm, I'm going to give him another chance. But he was fuming. Came back maybe a few hours after. And he sat down in his big chair. It's quiet. Everybody's got eyes for him. He says, OK, he's going to kill now. He's going to, that's what he does. He did it. Like he's got a step too far now. He's, he's done. He says, young man, I'm going to ask you. And I try to contain myself with all my might right now. And I'm going to ask you to think before you answer. What's your name? Again, that kid says, oh, I cannot say what your age, who's are your parents, what kind of Harley you're driving. No, I have to be, what's my name? <laughs> and again, he says, sir, king, my name is Alexander. And then the king, again, couldn't take it, just could not take it. And he says, well, Here's what's going to happen today. You're going you're gonna to either behave like an Alexander or you're going to change your name. Now I'll go back to the field. Let that sing for a minute. That kid did not die. But he says, here's what's going to happen today. You're going to change your name or you're going to behave like an Alexander. What's our name today? What's our name? We're talking about in the intro, our name is Christian. Our name is saved. Eternal life is our destination. God the Father is my dad. And then, when there's a little trouble in our lives, we don't behave like so. And then, when there's a little storm, we don't behave like it. It's easy for me to watch Netflix for four hours. It's hard for me to turn to God when I'm in time of sorrow. I'm doing lots of leadership stuff online right now and, and messages and stuff, and they're saying, when your, your boat is rocking, no matter what's happening, what do you do? Study. I found the same thing in the Christian world. When, when your boat is rocking, learn about your dad a little bit more. So I can have a character inside of me because I am the Son of God. This is my identity. I am Christ-like. Guys, if you have not given your life to Jesus, we're going to deal with that after. But if you gave your life to Jesus, that doesn't mean you'll be perfect. But He's going to give you the power to act like Him. He's going to give you the peace like He has. He's going to give you a new life. A new way of seeing things. A new peace that you will not understand, the Bible says. That surpasses any understanding. Everything. And what's the Bible say about identity? Let's see if that works again. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Anybody who's got their Bible here? You do? Can you read that? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If you don't have your Bible, you can follow it here. And Carson, you got a big voice, Pastor Man. Sure. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. It is. I got the, a different version that says the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The behold part is like, ah, right? Angela, see, there's something that happened. Does it say, Sly became perfect. He will not hurt you. He will not offend you. Didn't say that. I will offend you. Just so you know, if you come back, I, there's a chance. Pastor Carson and I will offend you. Okay? Because we are human. 
but we're going to try to love on you most, more, most as we can. This verse speaks volumes about transformative power of faith in Christ. Okay, I like that. So in the commentary it says, it speaks a lot about if you have faith in Jesus Christ, your inner will change. And then, get what? Your outward will change too. People will see something happen. You cannot fake that. That's our identity. The old is gone, and behold, the new is coming. The new is here. Not coming, is here. Now, we're going to deal with the matter of grace and what Jesus did on the cross. Next week, we're going to talk about the why. So, but today, I just want to present and introduce our, our, what's the Bible say we are. And then we're going to start to have faith in it, act like it, walk in it, sleep in it, have a shower in it. We are going to emerge ourselves in it. We cannot just say, I'm a Christian. And in our Christian world, especially in the bikers, we're saying, I'll forget I'm safe for five minutes. Come with me in that corner. <laughs> right? It's just only me. Like somebody just cut you off. Oh. Right? Just grace for that, guys. Still need to repent. Right? Are we perfect or are we not? No. But we serve a perfect God. And the most, the, the hardest thing to do when we come to Christ is to forgive ourselves of all the crap we did in the past. Is it easy? No. It's not. But why are we not forgiving us and asking Jesus to give us the know-how when He did on the cross? Who are we? What's our names? We're His. Since the cross, and we took the cross. The Bible, it's easy. The Bible just says, believe that, did that. Died on the cross for all your sin. My friend, Pastor Morris, was a biker, younger. We were just talking on the phone this week, and talking about some... We were not perfect. I used to be a cokehead. I was not perfect. But the Lord grew me into something. I used to curse, and I, if you were not here, I was cursing five day, five words out of, like, one word was okay. Might be love, blah, 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 right? I was on coke, and my friends were saying, I just um, um, went to church, rededicated my, I like that word today, my life to Jesus. I still have the coke in the nose, but I didn't curse anymore for some reason. I didn't even know. So we're high as a kite in a car on Main Street in Grand Bay, Quebec, and my friend says, Laporte, dude, you're speaking weird right now. That's not you. <laughs> I, like, I didn't even realize that. Right? And and says, but is that that church thing? I says, yeah, that's a church, but Jesus is so awesome. Christian music and the radio and everything. But I was still a go get. Was it perfect? No. But now I had grace. Now I had to listen to what he wanted and to give me what I needed, not what I wanted. Because my life was so selfish, I wanted. I want. This is me. I want. But God is giving me what I need. So I need to shut up a little bit and to get what I need. The nutrient in the plant is what I need. You know what I mean? That what's good for me is what I need. I don't know what's good for me. I did not create me. Does it make sense a little bit? So what does that mean? That's a weird one, but couldn't change it. I have been crucified with Christ and no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That's that thing just for a minute before we continue. So how, how can that be? I believe in Christ because he went to the cross. How can that be? That's the only thing that matters. Believing in Jesus that died on the cross, raised from the dead. So I can be called a child of God. That's the only thing that matters. Because now He lives in me. I no longer live by myself. I like that. Because there's nothing good. The Bible, another place I could have put there. I want to make it simplified today, but another place in the Bible says there's nothing you can do when he talks about the, 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 the tree or the branch or the vine. There's nothing you can do without me. Carson, 
Can we do anything right? No. We know it. We need Him. We cannot please God if there's no faith in it. I can do all things through Christ. That strengthens me. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, that's, that's it. I've been crucified on the cross with Jesus. All my sins are there. All of them. Now He lives in me. It's no longer me. The life I know, no, I, was, I live by faith in the Son of God. We see our circumstances exploding in our face, but if we live in faith that Jesus got it, He got it covered. Who loves me and gave Himself for me. There was no, no, nothing I could have done to expiate or to forgive or to, to purchase my sins. Because I was born in sin. I did not even choose it. Since Adam and Eve, it's been called, called, culti cultivate, cultivating. Please, farmers, help me here. And it's been growing for me. So I get there. It's already big. And we all fall short to His standards. We need Jesus daily. A good dose too. I'm not perfect because I'm here with a microphone. Paul says, I'm the king of the sinners, but I am saved by grace. That's the same here. So what's your name? Again. Eventually we'll get it. What's her name? What's my name? It's not slide. Woo! Like it. So, Pastor Carson, because you don't need a, a microphone, John 15, 15, friends of Jesus, this is one of the most awesome, awesome words from himself to us. When you read the Bible, whatever the, 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 the promise or the verse is, put your first name in front of it. Slide. I no longer. So, Carson, do that. Start with, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in now you are my friend, since I've told you everything the Father told me. And if you start with, Carson, I no longer call you servant. Let's read a Bible like that, guys. Slide. I no longer call you servant. Why? Why would I put my name in front? Because that testament is your inheritance. Inheritance. Yes, there you go. It's your heritage. If we, I was asking Carla to prepare for Isaiah 54. The whole thing, the protection, and that you've got to confine those liars to nothing, and every judgment against you will not prosper, and blah, blah, blah. At the end, it says, this is your heritage. That's part of our identity. We have the birthright. This is what we have, okay? I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. But Jesus then, instead, I have called you friends for everything I learned from my Father. I taught you, I give it to you. So we are not Jesus, but we're covered by Him. We are walking in His grace for what He did. We need to believe that and do the best we can to, to educate ourselves, to read the Word, and do the best we can. That's all He's asking. And humble ourselves and come back to the cross thing. I have to about 25 times a day. If it's not more. I was a youth pastor in Truro and our overseer was in Mountain, New Brunswick. Pastor Steve still is, right? He's still the overseer there. Long time. Great man of God. We love him. Pastor Brian was my senior pastor. Once a week on Wednesdays, we would drive from Truro, which is about two and a half hour ride, going south to Mountain, and we'd go play golf. Where we would play golf on Wednesday because it was cheap was nine bucks. Okay, so that's the only thing we could afford. And uh, and uh, we put lots of faith in, in Pastor Brian's car too. <laughs> so we were going there, and we were playing in the nine hole, the last one. It's very short, but past the green is the ocean. There's a drop of five hundred feet. It goes like that up, and you need to crank it up to bring your ball there. And it's gonna come back to you, and it's crazy. But after is the ocean. After that big rock, there's a big wind. So we had a bad day. It was raining. We're three pastors together, and we're walking, and I'm having a bad day. I'm having a bad day. Pastor Steve's having a bad day. 
And, and uh, Brian, I'm very surprised, Pastor Brian did not say anything. He had a bad day. We were not having fun. We did not want to be there. We just wanted to drive home, have a coffee, and go sleep. That's what I wanted. And all of a sudden, I got Pastor Steve doing a thing, and he gets their grass, and he injured his arm a little bit. And then I say, Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. And I was like, what? You're perfect. You're not. What's going on? He says, oh, he says, I've been repenting every minute of this day. Oh, he says, I thought, thank you, Jesus. I thought I was the only one. And he says, no. He says, I didn't get a couple of curses in. But you guys are not here. <laughs> and I had to repent for that. But I knew. And we had a meeting. He says, okay, let's. Let's, let's deal with that. So we had a coffee and a nice meal after, and we just say, hey, what are we learning today, boys? Our circumstances suck bad, but we did a lot of repenting. So we're all brought back to our church talking about repentance as we need it. Yeah. Not perfect! That was that. And I'm almost done, guys. I don't like to speak for hours. <laughs> Yeah, hi. <laughs> I'm not Pastor Carson. All right. So, what's her name? Again, this is the title today, but it's a real question I want us to think about today. And as we're going on our days in this week and this month, what's my name? Who am I representing? Who am I belonging to? Um, uh, a pastor that I got lots of um, love for. And I'm praying often as pastor, I don't even know if he's still alive, you probably will tell me that, is Pastor Bill Wilson, Metro Ministry. That guy, last time I heard, was 70 years old. He got something like 50,000 kids all over the place going to Sunday school. That's his ministry. He wrote a book called, Whose Child Is This? That's the, the other question I should have been there. Who's our we? Who's our we? My mom and dad, Monique and Gerard. Yeah, God used them to raise me up. They did an okay job. Not very good, but okay, because they're human too, right? My mom brought me to church all the time. My dad was always drunk. Sorry, dad. So, um, but my identity, when I'm in trouble, I'm not gonna look at my dad or mom. There's certain tips my dad gave me to help me. But I'm going to go for the one that created me. That's my identity. And I will never deny my parents. I love my parents. My mom's still kicking. Uh, and she is still praying. She's a prayer warrior. She's in ministry. Okay, let's, uh, let's close this very soon. I promise. That's the first thing. First Corinthians 12, 27. We keep on going on what's your name on this one. This First Corinthians 12, 27. Member of Christ's body. Louder, Carson. Pastor <laughs> <laughs> well, Morris, do you have it? Is Carson even here? <laughs> I don't know. We can't hear him. Pastor Morris. Oh, you want that red? Yep. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Amen. That's it. Plain and simple. We're united by faith, by faith, believers, uh, from the collective body of Christ. All over the place, all over the world, we are identifying with Jesus. Everywhere we are. We have faith in Jesus. That's all my point is. So if we are in the body of Christ, the Bible goes on and talk about identity. Also, my identity is my brothers and sisters that believe in the same as me. Maybe somebody does not believe in Christ yet. Why are we not so happy to tell them, to show them, Trevor did that today. Why are we not so happy to bring somebody? Why are we not so happy to, to, you got the most awesome thing in the world. I've got that business opportunity. Oh, you love that. We do that often. 
adopted, but we don't point Jesus to Christ, uh, uh, people to Christ. I identify with the most rich, perfect, eternal person that ever will exist, that created me, that was there at the beginning, and that's there today, that's here today with me. Let's show him. Let's point people. Our job is just to point them to him, to pray for people. Colossians 3.12, chosen people of God. Therefore, as God chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Humility, come back to the cross. When you got a little baby in Christ that makes mess everywhere, we have patience, clean up the mess, pray with them, help them, walk with them. Bible say, somebody asks you to walk a mile, guess what, we don't walk two. This is what that means. Why? Because that's what Jesus did, and that's what he does. You know what, Pastor Carson? We're so blessed to be here because Jesus was in Mars too. Right. Jesus broke so many laws. Just touching a prostitute say, hey, I forgive you. Mm -hmm. Sin no more, just go. Well, now I'm not saying that we're, you know, we all need Jesus. Our sins are showing a different rates or a different size. But in our heart, that's where the problem is. My identity, who am I? I'm a child of God. I'm a Christian. And I'm going to remember that story. And that's why that story, I've been speaking that for years. Because that story touched me. And the Lord said, hey, you're going to do it. Change your name or you're going to act like a Christian. That's basically what I'm asking today. That's basically what the Lord will ask you to understand, to hear. There's a takeaway for this. Oh, boy. There you go. That's important. Focus on Jesus. Repent when you know that you are wrong. And when I pray, says, God, if I don't have anything that I know that I did wrong, please, would you cover me? And bring it up to mind so I can actually make it right. When we fall short of the standards of God or short of His glory, the Bible said, we need to humble ourselves. We need to humble. It's not a rule for one or two purple people. It's everybody. We're all called to surrender to Him. But here's what's going to happen. He will come all the more in his supernatural strength. And, and our friend Pastor Matt likes to say, he'll come in your natural. He'll be super. So you're super natural. He's going to be super in your natural. This is who I am. This is what the Bible say I am. Don't let anybody else told you that you're not that. Let's remember, change your name. If you do not wish to walk with them and to do like Him, like the redeemed in Christ that you are. If you don't want to change your name says, I'm no longer a Christian, good. Let's humble ourselves. And let's go with that. Because there's nothing we can do wrong. We need Him. Does that make sense, guys? That's all I got for you guys.